Heating and cooling are essential to our everyday lives, and they have to run sustainably. So far, we've explored the difference between cooling for people and cooling for equipment. Now it's time to see just how efficient it can be. John, this is an amazing facility. So here at the Science Museum of Minnesota, there's lots of visitors, and we need to keep these visitors nice and comfortable. But we also have to preserve the artifacts here in the museum. This is Patrick Hamilton. He's the manager of sustainability initiatives. Well, Patrick, the, the museum's been around for a while. Have you always used this kind of efficient heating system, or is this relatively new for you guys? Sure. Back in 2010, the Science Museum contracted with a consulting mechanical engineer to do a top-to-bottom energy analysis of this building. Several months later, he came back with his report, and he said this building was using 6.5 million kilowatt hours of electricity annually. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a facility manager, but I am a geographer. So I put that in terms that I could understand. What he was saying is that this one building in 2010 was using as much electricity as all 300 households in an 18 block area of St. Paul. Wow, well, how exactly does the system work? Well, under his recommendation, we purchased and installed two devices called heat recovery chillers, a fancy name for a big commercial scale heat pump. Think of your refrigerator, which takes heat out of the compartment and then dumps it into the air in the kitchen. These devices take that heat energy that they extract from the compartment from the Science Museum, and we use that heat energy to warm the fresh but cold air that we bring in all winter long. How exactly is all that heat generated? Well, our bodies generate heat, but also all the electricity coursing through the Science Museum, it eventually degrades into heat. And prior to doing the heat recovery system, we expelled a lot of that heat energy to the environment. How does that raise the efficiency of the facility? Well, depending on the severity of the heating season, we've been able to cut our purchases of hot water by 35 to 60 percent. Wow, and I know that what we look at, what we see here, is really only a small part of the Science Museum of Minnesota. Uh, you're actually charged with taking care of a large number of artifacts. That's right. Two million artifacts we have the responsibility for maintaining in perpetuity. And we need to maintain very narrow humidity and temperature controls on those objects, much more narrow than the public at large, which is quite challenging given the extremes of Minnesota's climate from cold to hot from winter to summer. So, John, this sounds to like an immediate use kind of situation where the, the air comes in, they warm it, and then bring it back into the museum to be used to keep people comfortable or to keep the art artifacts protected. Uh, but it seems to me that as efficient as that is, we could really even raise the efficiency more by storing that energy for later use. Yep, absolutely. And now we're using thermal energy storage battery systems. And systems like this that do heating and cooling are becoming even more efficient. Let's go back to White Bear Lake and I'll show you one. Sounds good. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. So, Greg, think of this system as having a battery. But instead of storing electrons in these batteries, we're actually storing cooling and heating for later use depending on the building's needs. Okay, well how exactly does it do that? Yep, we've got a chiller that actually can make ice within each of these tanks. Each tank consists of 1,600 gallons of water, which changes phase from water to ice and back into water. When they have ice in the tanks, you can actually store cooling in those tanks to provide cooling for the building. And by a byproduct, we're actually melting those tanks and turning those into water. When they're filled with water, we can actually source heat from that water and provide heating to your building with the use of a heat pump or a heat recovery chiller. And by doing that, we're actually refreezing those tanks and back into ice. Okay, well, how much energy does each of these tanks hold? Yep, so each tank consists of 2 million BTUs of cooling, which is enough cooling to cool four 2,000 square feet houses for an entire day. What are some of the other benefits to installing a system like this? Yeah, so there's several benefits. The number one benefit is that it improves the business's bottom line. There's utility incentives to encourage businesses to use their energy during off-peak times instead of peak times. And by building ice during those off-peak times, the company actually will save costs on their utility bills because they're not consuming energy during those peak times. Right, well I would imagine having a thermal storage unit like this would be great to integrate into a system that maybe uses renewable energy sources. Yep, so thermal energy storage is a great way to supplement renewable energy sources such as wind and solar, which aren't continual generation of sources. So by storing that energy into thermal energy batteries like these, that actually makes the utility grid more resilient and lowers the carbon emissions on the grid.
So far, we've explored the science behind cutting-edge thermal energy storage and the benefits of chiller plants. But how do you integrate yesterday's cooling systems into tomorrow's world? John, uh, a company's ready to upgrade their HVAC system. What are some of the uh, resources that are available for them to figure out exactly what the best thing to do is? Yeah, so there's lots of resources out there. One really um, important resource is energy modeling software. So Train makes an energy modeling software called Trace 3D+. Plus. And this allows a customer, a building owner, to model their building and to evaluate different systems and compare and contrast each of those systems in terms of how much energy and how much environmental impact those systems have. Okay, well, say this is a, a business that isn't ready to overhaul their entire HVAC system. They want to just integrate some new controls into that. Can Train help them with that? Yep, so by doing this energy modeling or using other tools that Train has, we can actually uh, decipher which of the actions is going to have the most impact and, and most economic sense for the company. Okay, well, we talked a, a lot about uh, heat pumps and the, the way they are used to cool and heat buildings and such. Are there other sort of energy sources that can be used along with that? Yeah, so we talked about air source heat pumps, so pulling right. heat out of that air and putting that heat into the building. But there's other sources of heat out there. For example, geothermal allows you to pull heat out of the ground, or maybe you want to pull heat out of wastewater or a lake. So you can source heat from different sources and actually pull that heat into the building in order to heat that building. Well, I mean, we're talking about a lot of systems here. Things are starting to get a little bit complicated. Yeah. I, I want to know how you integrate all of this and control it. So I've set you up with Jane. She's our controls expert, and she's going to walk you through how all these systems work together. Excellent. Hi, Jane. Hi, Greg. Well, John and I talked a lot about different systems, and I want to know how they all work together. And he says you're the expert on control. Well, there are millions of pieces of heating and cooling equipment in buildings around the world. And the real opportunity is to connect them through equipment controls, which really act as the brain. Okay, well, say I have a business, and I'm not in a financial position to upgrade my entire HVAC system all at once. Would integrating one of these control modules into my existing system provide me with any benefits? Yes, many companies take a phased approach. In fact, only 2% are really considered high-end smart buildings. So that's a lot of opportunity out there for upgrading buildings. Well, I imagine if you have a, a large office building, you have hundreds of offices, even a small change could have a big impact. Yes, just by upgrading controls, you can take advantage of the technology to help you really dial in that energy optimization. And a small improvement can have a huge measurable impact across 100 office spaces. Give me a real world example of a, an older system that's being kept relevant by the use of one of these control modules. Yeah, we work with a hospital in Canada that's had a train chiller for 40 years. And just through ongoing maintenance and control updates and modernization, we expect to extend the life of that another 10 years. Well, I'd really like to see this all in operation. Is there any way I can get a look at that today? Yeah, let me send you over to meet Susie. She's got a great demonstration plan for you. Hi, Susie. Hey, Greg. So Jane was telling me about all the different systems that might exist in a building. She said you could tell me how they all work together. Yeah, so this is our train solution center. This is where we bring our customers in to demonstrate how these different systems get pulled together in a single user interface. Excellent. Well, how, how do we get started? So most buildings have secured access, and you'd badge in in the morning, and the building responds to your badge like this. Okay. Let's take a look. 